let's see. All right, so the, the creative, when this creative intuitive man takes over, then there's the birth of art and wonder yes. and clay jugs and, and a beautiful gate and clothes. Um, yeah. And the, this, what did he call it? The Columbrium of the concepts. The Roman Columbrium. Is, yeah, it's like concepts. a giant structure of columns. For dead ashes. I looked it up, but I think it's for dead people. Oh, oh, it's an interesting comparison then. Like he's yeah. almost saying it, they're they're empty and dead concepts. It's yeah, kind of columbrium. Yeah, yeah. Colum a columbrium is a structure for the respectful and usually public storage of funerary urns, <laughs> holding the cremated remains of the deceased. So that's he's intentionally yeah. picked that. Yeah. All right, it's too restrictive, the Columbrium. He needs some yeah. some kind of uh, Olympian cloudlessness to play with, to have, a, to play around. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we, 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 we did speak about this highlight here, which was mine, how yeah. without, re without clarity around what specific thing he's thinking of it's hard to know what he means like why he's saying that the man guided by concepts never gains happiness but wards off misfortune like without the knowledge of what he's referring to I don't he's probably thinking of a stoic where uh, is there about like controlling their emotions above all else it seems like he's thinking of so you're not achieving happiness they're they're just attaining control of whatever they fear like right control like in that case it might be fear of their emotions so they become rigid and try to only avoid rather than seek right uh and now he talks about and while he aims for the greatest possible freedom from pain which i'm not sure what he means by that but the intuitive man standing in the midst of a culture already reaps from his intuition, a harvest of continually inflowing illumination, cheer and redemption. In addition to attaining def a defense against misfortune. I'd be curious to hear your take on why he thinks he aims for the greatest possible freedom from pain. And it's like a liberation in with, through these metaphors and that the pain of, or even emptiness of this, or maybe even referring to earlier, like that meaninglessness of the universe doesn't care about you. He doesn't, he wants to be free of that pain, free of right. even these constrictions and seeks this extreme freedom of intuition and chaos. But the, isn't the, the one who, isn't the, the one who is guided by the concepts and abstractions, usually the one who fools himself in, to use Nietzsche's language. Yeah. I think, that he, the universe does care about him. So why would it, why would it free you from pain if you admit the universe doesn't care about you? Yeah, maybe it's not that one then. I think it's just referring to like, just a freedom from these restrictions, these pains of the world. Mm, okay. I don't, I'm not really quite sure actually. But yeah, he's talking about somebody who wants like a freedom to do what they will. Yeah. This man who at other times seeks nothing but sincerity, truth, freedom from deception and protection against ensnaring surprise attacks. And that's interesting. Now executes a masterpiece of deception. He executes his masterpiece of deception and misfortune as the other type of exec the other type of man executes his in times of happiness. Hmm. So it seems like he's saying that the abstractions are simply some kind of like protection oh, against stoic, pain. Though. Yeah, protection against stoic, pain. Yeah. And yeah. So it's driven by uh, motivation by fear. Is that what he's saying? And then this, this so. his hero, his overjoyed hero is driven by motivation by love. Is that the no, distinction? This is in con so you got the overjoyed man that Olympian clownlessness in contrast to the stoical man, this man, the stoic, 
who seeks, it seems he seeks sincerity, true freedom for deception, all these same things. But he's also executing a, this man, or actually, I'm not sure if he's referring to this man as in the one who suffers more intensely, or is he referring to the Stoic? Okay, well, well let's go further back. Because so he's sure. saying, he, this, so this is the creative man. He's saying he claims doesn't learn from experience and keeps yeah. falling over and over again into the same ditch. Yes. Which that that's interesting. I guess he's saying maybe as a result of this creativity, because he sees everything anew, he keeps making the same mistake. I think so. Which is interesting because there's no regularity in nature, according to Nietzsche. So, yeah, that's it would seem interesting that he's not realizing here there's implicitly there is a regularity why is it happening over and over if not just for unless he's suggesting that there is a purpose and reason that these things exist besides this pure truth rather it seems like they do exist because they prevent you from falling in these ditches of living he is then just as irrational in sorrow as he is in happiness. He cries aloud and will not be consoled. How differently the stoical man who learns from experience and governs himself by concepts is affected by the same misfortune. Okay, so he is talking about the stoical man here. Yeah. This so man, yeah. He wants the same things, but he makes an even greater deception. I guess lying about his own misfortune, just pretending it doesn't exist basically. What, what are the ensnaring surprise attacks? What do you think he's referring to there? Um, I'm not sure. It seems like a reference to something, but I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a reference, I think. So here he talks about, I guess, the creative man quivering and <laughs> with a quivering and changeable human face, almost like some crazy... Uh, guy dancing in the rain from the jungle. A mask oh, was big enough. Stoic. The Stoic does that. Yeah, yeah, but he's contrasting it to this man with a quivering and changeable human face. And he's saying the Stoic is the one with the dignified symmetrical features. Yes. So those are the two opposites. So you have a quivering, changeable human face, or you have one that's dignified. I guess one that's passionate and emotional. Oh, right, maybe. yes. Yeah, maybe, uh, no I mean. quivering. What is that? He does not cry, he does not even alter his voice. When a real storm cloud thunders above him, he wraps himself in his cloak. And now with slow steps, he walks from beneath it. That's a nice image, though. I kind of like the sound of the yeah. stoic based on that. Wrapping yourself yeah. in a cloak. Mm, okay. It's a good description, I think, of what a stoic is like. They're like, they go through with um, contentment and not even a certain resi resignation to the way the world is. It's almost like emotional but at the same time, lacking emotion, like suppressing emotion. That's kind of what Nietzsche is kind of describing. Right. They aren't embracing emotion. Do you think that, uh, <laughs> I wonder if Nietzsche should be prescribed um, curriculum for people who have uh, re repression? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, I mean, it lets you release your fears within yourself in a very poetic way. <laughs> um, it is interesting that I, I wonder, though, if I haven't read any Stoicism, although I know it's it's gained a lot of popularity and I keep hearing Stoic philosophy yeah. dropped and people dropped as in mentioned and I people mentioning they, they want to study it or read this or Seneca's. Seneca's works or whatever. And I wonder if there is um, wisdom and value in terms of, you know, the serenity prayer where yes. God give me the serenity to uh, accept that which we can't, I can't change, courage to fight that which I can, wisdom noted the difference. Like, I wonder if, if that part of the, that, that part of the phrase of that which I cannot change, stoic, philosophy does give you good ways to think about it. It can be. I think to an extent, Stoicism is a bit Christian 
uh. in a in a weird way. Uh, like Marcus Aurelius, I think was writing for more. I forget when did he write meditations. I don't know if Christianity was around. But anyway, yeah, I mean, there is that attitude. Although I do wonder at times, to what extent does it underappreciate emotion? Right. But uh, I look at um, Nietzsche is a good example, I think, to think about because in terms of our relationship to emotion, it's not, it's, it's actually, it's not self-evident and it's not easy to tell that emotions are derived from thoughts yeah. by some cause and effect relationship, right? right? So whatever attitude you have, it's either it's all emotion or it's no emotion. And it, I don't know at what point in the development someone makes a connection between thought and emotion, but it's not given the history we have and the introspective like even Eastern culture, Eastern culture is quite introspective. And I don't know if there's a, there's some explicit mention of a relationship between thought and emotion. So. Um, I think Nietzsche kind of gets at it throughout his writings. Oh, really? He seems to acknowledge psychology as a, something relevant, as something important. Um, oh, did you close that by accident? There's no, no, I, I've paragraph. just changed. Oh. I've just, oh, I uh, see. Is, was there? He was, no, we got yeah, to the end. That was the end. There's one more page or paragraph. No, no oh, we're I at the end. Then. Yeah, we, the end is when the real cloud, uh, storm cloud thunders above him, he wraps himself in the cloak and with slow steps, he walks from beneath it. That was, that's the end of mine. Let me see. Did I? Page nine. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I don't know what I missed there. But yeah, that sense of chaos seems to be what Nietzsche is talking about. That you should at least, he's like almost pointing out the relevance of intuition more so than he's saying, bring out your intuition, make use of intuition and live it chaotically if you need to. But maybe one error of his thinking is that he underappreciates reason. He only sees the flaws. He sees how you can be constrained, but not how you could be helped by it. And maybe but another I, way to think I, of. Oh, go I, ahead. I, I was just point out though that like you're saying he only sees the flaws, but is in the case of Euthyphro, for example, who he, he speaks of the man who adopts um, concepts, is that someone who's using reason? Because like depends on your conception of reason. Yeah, right. that too. There is a complicated relationship with reason. Like, you, it's hard to understand Nietzsche's take on it. I'm not even sure what he thinks about reason. It never seems very consistent. Um, do you know when, when in the development of philosophy, people started thinking about thoughts, emotions in relations to thoughts. Cause I can see how it's so hard to draw the line sometimes, especially when you like, you don't know what made you feel a certain way, but it's likely it still had a basis. It's just not clear what, whether it's like a small micro expression in someone's face or whatever. Throughout the 1800s is all I can really think of huh. when you've got like Nietzsche as part of that, like towards the end of the 1800s in particular, when people start to understand the brain more, where they actually knew what neurons were. They yeah. knew that electricity went through your head and all these categories of psychology. I think that's a lot what spurred on that kind of thinking about emotions and mm. where they come from. I think Freud was influenced by Nietzsche somewhat. And wow. other philosophers at the time, um, like William James, he wasn't a philosopher, he was a psychologist, but he wrote like philosophy all the time or as if he were a philosopher. So a lot of that early thinking, late 1800s, early 1900s, that's when people really started to take notice from a more like the content of emotion, not just right. that you have them, but what do they consist of? What right. do they indicate about the world? Hmm. Okay. What about, um, 
so we're talking about stoicism and what I was trying to get at is although if you take the philosophy on the whole you know if you take any philosophy on the whole you could argue and I think Rand talks about simply she says if you want to assess philosophy simply look at the metaphysics and epistemology and that'll essentialize it if you can get a grasp grasp on those two that that will essentialize the philosophy as a if it is a system systematized body of work that will essentialize it but ignoring that i i was wondering about like value in terms of you know like where let's say there is something you need to face in life that uh you don't have control over like lockdowns are a good example right there's a sense of like yeah. loss of control and and some and there's there's other things that you don't control and some of it is unpleasant and so i, I do wonder if even though some philosophies like let's say stoicism let's say they've got the wrong metaphysics and epistemology or or they're let's just say you, uh, metaphysics and epistemology you disagree with but th- there would st- them that doesn't uh mean they might not have really valuable intelligent insights on how to face um yeah. things you can't control right like surely there's heaps yeah. of wisdom to be mined from almost every philosopher thoughts I think so. I think you can find at least traces of ideas. You can see the evolution of ideas. I think that can be helpful. But also you can get an area of something that you find makes you ask good questions. It makes you realize things you didn't realize before. Right. Yeah. Which I I mean, I've read Meditations There's by Marcus Aurelius and half of it I don't really like but there are parts I really enjoy it gives yeah. me a way of looking at like leaving aside any errors I have it is a good way of talking about there's sometimes things are just a fact of the way things are you can't do anything about it so it's about your attitude and I think that's very informative about how to think about life right yeah because it it's possible also, have you had the experience where you'll fall into a certain trap, a way of thinking that is not healthy? And I, when I say not healthy, I just mean like it's it, you're thinking about something you can't control and it's unpleasant. But and, you've, and when I say you fall into a trap, I mean someone else has fallen into it before and found a way to navigate it, not, not to take away its pain, but just to navigate it better. And so, you know, maybe you find those those maps to navigate those traps, whether it is dealing with something you can't control, whatever else in random philosophy, like random philosophers texts, even if they may have all the wrong metaphysics or epistemology. Yeah. I feel that way about Nietzsche personally. Right. Like Nietzsche, I have like seen, he resonates with me. I mean, you might find a different philosopher that particularly resonates with you because they present you with certain puzzles, I guess, and they've solved it sometimes. Yeah. In this unique way. And to me, it's helped me to recognize that intuition isn't something to ignore. I yeah. mean, I don't agree with Nietzsche about the metaphors and all that, but what he says about intuition kind of influences me that I can yeah. see why I have problems in life because I overlook my intuition, that I don't trust myself enough, that I mm. don't just let things go. And just be creative about it. I don't need to have a rigid plan always. As much as that's beneficial, sometimes I need to use my intuition and build from there. I can't always start with the analysis right straight away. Right. I have to take different steps right. than I might expect. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, yeah, definitely enjoyed exploring this. So we can go to. I did, I actually wrote this before we, we spoke for many hours about this essay so we can review it. I, I mean, I, I uh, put down some key terms. I think we covered perceptual metaphor. It was like the first, that image you create when you think of the first level abstraction like chair, moral impulse. Well, I was curious what your take on that is. Um, um, I'll go through them one at a time. So as far as perceptual metaphor, there is a psychologist that I like some of his theories and I was going to mention to them to you later that a lot of concepts are built through metaphor 
that metaphor are metaphors are very important for our conceptual development. He's not saying it's all metaphors, but that metaphors are an important part of developing our concepts. Right. So it's not just something Nietzsche came up with that nobody cared about since then. There is some validity in it that metaphors are in some way help your thinking, that they aren't irrelevant things, that they make connections and it helps your thinking. Isn't it, isn't it the same as thinking through analogy, essentially, like yes. by trying to identify the similarities and differences using things yeah. that are not necessarily logically the same or logically similar, but have, share some characteristic? Is that, it's the yeah, same I thing? Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay. And then what do you, what do you think of moral impulse? I think he's talking about just that intuition or just that feeling people have, like, I want to do the right thing. And they, they only think about like impulse. Like, That's true. What's good. It's, like there's some sense of, yeah. I want to do what's good. Yeah. And it's just that impulse. It's yeah. not really analyzed. And sometimes it can be very constraining because it's unanalyzed. Right. Uh, and then let's see. I know what volatile, volatile but I know what that is. That's like to steam it and mess up the columbrium with all, all the creativity. In a way, and I then, imagine that like Peacock's train, like that's like making the concept like so rich with associations and image and thought that it's, you volatilize the metaphor, that you've made it volatile, you made it energized and uh, almost has a power of its own. Ah, oh, I used, that's, I like that, but I, I read it differently because I looked up volatize and it turned out, I looked it up later after I wrote this, but volatile was, a uh, let me just, to make or become, no, so it was uh, volatilize. It was, it was actually to turn into steam or something. Oh. Yeah, I think it was some kind of chemical process. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, then I misread it. I was going to select uh, disappear it. Well, I guess there could be multiple meanings because here's one disappear as fumes because he was talking about the columbrium uh, and then volatilizing all the, uh, yeah, I didn't know what it was, but I, I looked that up. So I think that's one possible meaning in the context. I think that's what it was, yeah. I, but I left that there. That was, um, and then schema, schema, schemata. How would you, di would you make any distinction between that and like when people use that? Because I've heard that in psychology. You know, like what is it, schema therapy or whatever the hell that is with this the boy it. and the girl, and I, I don't know what I don't know what that is. <laughs> this is Don't worry. I don't know what that is either. But any distinction between like a structure and a framework and um okay. No, I don't there's synonyms to me. I treat them as synonyms the <clears throat> structure or framework. And with the aesthetic, what other than how something strikes your senses, what how would you characterize an aesthetic an art a feel a style um like sunsets even have an aesthetic you could say their their appearance it, it's just i probably don't have a very good concept of it yeah I me neither it's such a floating it's such a floating uh term we can we can skip it i don't want to dig deep yeah. into that i can i can come back to that another time yeah i should uh, okay. That's a good question. Uh, so you talk about Nietzsche rejecting things in the cells. I didn't realize he accepted an Aristotelian account of concepts because I thought he he is. So Aristotle was saying the essence is in the thing out there, but is that what he's? I thought he was just saying we don't know um, anything. We just we just get a nerve stimulus and we have no means. You might be right. He okay. might not be quite Aristotelian either. But I guess I wrote scenes. I think. I would change it, but as far as he's saying that concepts are formed by this measurement omission kind of thing and forgetting, it's just that Nietzsche says rejects that it brings you to anything true or any essence, but concepts are formed that way nonetheless. Sorry, could you repeat that? Nietzsche seems to be thinking like concepts are still formed, like in terms of you unite things along a similarity and differentiate them as Aristotle would have you do. And he's just saying, you just saying that thing that the process, similarity is the metaphor yeah but that process is pointless Nietzsche would have us believe that 
that is part of Aristotle, that method is only taking you to things in themselves, that concepts themselves are not any true relationship to this pure truth. So even though concepts are made this way, it uh, would be lying to ourselves to think it actually brings us anywhere to this pure truth. It's just a, it's a spider's web over a flowing river strong enough not to get yeah. destroyed by the wind, but strong enough to get swept by a current, which I love that uh, description, yeah. but okay. Uh, let's see. But would you agree that he doesn't reject things in themselves? If anything, his whole conception is built on there are things in themselves and let's just have a party and make all these amazing webs and metaphors. Yeah, just acknowledge that you can't find it, never will, and just embrace yeah. your metaphors. Right. So, but it's he doesn't reject evolved. it then. He buys into that that premise, right? Um, I think he, re he rejects it. He uses that mode of thinking to then reject it. So it's hard to actually describe that. Like, he's using the concept in, in the process of obliterating it. Like, he used it in this destabilize and then say like throws it out it, it would seem a bit weird that yeah I don't know. he's talking about the thing in itself and he's rejecting it so how can you reject it unless you've at least accepted it at some point so i think he's almost saying that he used to think that way and now he's no longer doing that he's rejected that thing in itself or he's on his way to rejecting it he's trying he's working on it he thinks it's best to get rid of it so he's, yeah, he's yeah. almost, you're saying that he's not, he's just saying, but it, I mean, the reason I'm saying it's almost like he bought into the premise, well, regardless of what he thinks of it is because he talks about like, you know, later on, he talks about how if everyone have a, had a different sense, we wouldn't, there would be no regularity in nature. And so, uh, because, and so he emphasizes very much the impact that our senses have on us and and that we we don't know uh we have no way to determine what is correct perception that there's no and so it seems like he, well, that means he's buying into that whole thing correct perception is not even valid in each of eyes yeah it's not even a valid question unlike kant who would say oh, okay the question is valid when okay. he's just saying well, the question is not even valid you All can't right. even ask I, the yeah. Okay. It's not as clear. I don't, I'm not as clear on that, but let's skip it. Cause I don't have enough knowledge about that to really yeah. go much deeper into that. You could leave it aside as almost Nietzsche is earlier thinking was maybe a bit lost. And he didn't completely reject it yet. He's okay. still himself trapped by these concepts somewhat. Mm. In that Columbia. Better for worse. He's, he's, he's building his little hut. Yeah. He's trying to break free. <laughs> he's still attached. He's still attached to the tower a little bit, but he's trying to break free. That's how I think of it. <laughs> but uh, so it seems like initially I added this only today, actually. But so initially I was like, well, what does he, what does he actually say about the drive for truth? And at first I thought it was all about this desire to prevent war of all against war. War of all against war of all against all from Thomas Hobbes's idea, and intellect is for dissimulation and war and murder. But then we still live with people, so we only then start coming to agreements to prevent harm to ourselves. But then later on, he does talk about the drive for metaphors being some kind of instinct, and so that's that's the underlying desire for truthfulness. Would you agree with with uh, the desire for truthfulness is the drive for metaphors, this creative expression of metaphor. Yes, that's okay. what you said. Uh, it seems like, I think I wrote this a while ago as well. It seems like he's claiming artistic expression is the key to concept formation since we only play with the metaphors arbitrarily anyway. So let's, as I said, let's just have a party and weave lots of webs that are beautiful. Or at least that's the right way to think or the better way to think. He's not saying that's the key to concept formation. He's agreeing before, like, that is how you create concepts. Right. The concepts bind you too much. It's right. better to be this artistic thinker who lives passionately 
and is willing to make the same mistakes repeatedly and just right. play around even with irony. Right. It's kind of like uh, Funes, the yeah. memorious each, but although Funes doesn't make the same mistake, it's just yeah. Uh, the same or different than Rand. So, all right, let's go similarity. Similar to, there's, a, there's that, I don't know if this is similar to, okay, what's a similarity? Well, there's forgetting of differences. I mean, even Rand talks about forgetting yeah. of differences, right? In it's her case, she describes it as measurement emission. Yeah, you're not forgetting it in Rand's eyes. It's right. not like it disappeared. I mean, that's just a subtle wording difference. And Borges was suggesting literally forgetting. And Nietzsche was yeah. suggesting literally forgetting. But, but it is similar to a degree. But in the in the uh, omission, so you, you I, yeah, I guess it depends what the people mean. But like yeah. to forget differences could also mean to forget measurements, which is to omit measurements, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then I wrote, oh, I actually, now, now that I'm reading this and, and the rest, I'm not sure consciousness has a night. Well, well, I guess so. Consciousness has an identity and affects the perceptual data. He talks about, you know, our senses yeah. being, although it's hard. I don't know if that's true because he doesn't seem to say whether or not there is a, it's not clear if he does think there is a thing out there or, or it's just an experience he, and he's not. He questions identity. Not that he questions that there's consciousness, which is, right. but what is identity? And Nietzsche is less certain about identity. They sees more the infinite varieties of even say perception that how could you say there's a one identity if right. there's so many kinds. Right. And then the other similarity I got is that the essential, I'm not obviously there's a distinction between yes. the essential and the fundamental. The essential is not out there, but in relation to us. Yes. I think that's another similarity. Are there any others that I missed? Or man is the measure of all this of all things. I mean, that's a commonality for sure. Like they acknowledge that, yes, these are creations by man for man. Right. And the differences uh, in his case, the regularity of nature is dependent on our sense perception. So, you know, like, so depending on the, like, there's no form, I don't even know if it's correct to say this, but there's no form of the thing being perceived. There is just the perception and each perception is different and you don't know, it's it's not a quite, like I don't even think there is that distinction between form and object. There's just the perception. Yeah, I mean, you just, you see the world, the regularity is just something we invent. Yeah, um, by some kind of, time space association thing he was talking about i mean we just arbitrarily give it like oh it exists at this time or yeah we give it, it exists in this area and place so that's really a subjectivity about perception that there is no necessary connection between what you the concepts you hold and the world you perceive it's whatever you want it to be so there's no real regularity you can even identify the only regularity we identify is the effects because there is no such thing right. as this pure law. So all we do is we're identifying effects of what we think is the law. Right. We're only identifying effects. Right. It's amazing that he wrote this at 30, by the way. Yeah. Very, very intelligent. I wonder what, how were they educated then? Like what he, to be, today you don't learn anything, or at least I didn't about like Greek mythology or greek philosophy at oh. school or latin or anything like that he had a very strict regimen of learning in elementary and high school oh. like he studied latin he studied greek he studied for hours he worked it wasn't really a boarding school but he was there a long time and he was a really dutiful catholic at the time oh. or a christian oh. and he was like when he was like 14 and all he oh. was really yeah, and part of learning would include a lot of Latin translation, understanding the classics of ancient Greece, things like that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, 
And then, so one of the differences was, so we got that the regularity of nature being dependent on sense perception. And then I wrote, he, he buys into this. It seemed to me like, at least based on my understanding, it was the same as Kant. It was like, there's a thing out there. There's this X, which we, we can't perceive because our senses distort it. But you said, I'm not, I'm off there yeah. and I'm not going to go into that because I don't have enough knowledge to. It's uh, hard to say. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things that Nietzsche maybe didn't completely reject it as well as he thought. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. So I wanted to make some connections now. So yeah. do a bit of integration uh, with yeah. what we've read to just other. So we did Euthyphro, right? He talks about Euthyphro and uh, Euthyphro. Yeah, Euthyphro taking his dad to court in order to be pious without knowing what pious is, the man of abstractions and action, yeah. actions. Yeah. The, uh, the yeah. picture man, I like that little, <laughs> the picture man who makes. And the sound man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just reading uh, Atlas Shrugged and there, this is actually from some very recent scenes and I was curious if there was a relationship between this yeah. and what we've just read and if you could help me make it. So sure. Dagny speaks to a guy called Eugene Lawson and Eugene Lawson yeah. to uh, Eugene Lawson was this, um, I think he was a son of a wealthy family and he wanted to implement like love for all. And so he started yeah. running his dad's bank and he just made all these loans for people who needed it because he wanted to be a humane person. And then, so this, she's speaking to him and she's asking him for some records and let's see so now he's a bureaucrat okay let's see but i do not mind what i lost was mere material wealth this is after the banks collapse i'm not the first man in history to suffer for an ideal i was defeated by the selfish greed of those around me we we'll just uh highlight those things that i think might be relevant i couldn't establish a system of brotherhood and love in just one small state amid a nation of prop profit seekers and dollar grubbers. It was not my fault, but I won't let them beat me. I'm not to be stopped. I'm fighting on a wider scale for the privilege of serving my fellow men. Okay. Yeah. So let's go with this. Does this relate to his idea of like, is this what he, is this, is he, does it, does it have what he's saying in this uh, essay have, what would be the relationship between that and say this, I, this is idealism, right? This man who's fighting for this ideal he describes as love of all, for all, yeah, a system of brotherhood even, and love. Even in the philosophical sense, the idealism, like the, the real truth is out there, the, the real morality right. exists beyond ourselves. Like that, love. That is, yeah, it exists beyond man or it right. exists in a, from a pure state of, knowing and he's suffering for that that he's almost like whittled down his emotions and true self just to be held back and con conformed by these concepts given to him for by whatever it might be wherever he got it from and now he's blaming everyone else for for their failure that they're too grounded that they're too almost like they're too connected to life but he's the one that's really going for it. the true ideal, the true, the pure truth, what's really out there. And right. And the, the love is, is not, it, it's just a thing that's out there. That is some. Yeah. And then the, you know, his Nietzsche talking about it, helping the sto I think he said the stoic or the man of abstraction, the abstractions protect him from suffering. So is this yes. an example of, the abstraction so he's suffered and now he's like but it was for a good reason and so it ameliorates the suffering the I, this this uh i these would say so okay. that he's grabbing onto this because it makes him feel okay okay I mean, man doesn't really get into that but i think that would almost make sense given if we think of him as just some guy with this herd mentality he's just absorbing what he sees around him to be good to be altruistic um when he absorbs all that, he's just doing that because it it works for him. He feels good. 
he feels okay, like he can survive. Right. All right, so that's, and let's tie it to this one, which is also very closely. Yeah. Uh, this was very much, very soon after this same scene. This is Ivy Starnes. This is kind of, I put this in just because it's kind of funny and I, I don't know why, why she makes this association with Ivy Starnes and, and it's just going to ask her about that too, but she, this is, she gets to a little ill smelling yeah. bungalow <laughs> and she talks about waxy foliage made of thick vegetation <laughs> and yeah. uh, undusted corners with incense burning in silver. The oh, feet wow. of contorted oriental deities. <laughs> That's intense. <laughs> and she sits on a pillow <laughs> like a baggy Buddha, her mouth a tight little crescent, the petulant mouth of a child demanding adulation. This is not as related. The rest is related yeah. to the, the Nietzsche essay, but I just put this in here because I was like, what is this association that she has with because I've seen it's, you know, if we're talking about stereotypes, I've seen people who definitely fit into this stereotype, although yeah. absent, I'm not relating yeah. it to any of that, but what is with her, do you know by any chance the connection to maybe it's the sixties kind of thing or. Well, it was written in 57. So. Uh, okay. I think it's more the Buddhism thing. I think it started to, in the U S it started to get attention, like a renewed attention in the U S in the 50s at some point right so I, I would imagine that she's seen people who proclaim this buddhist belief and they live in this simplistic life i imagine that's where it's coming from yeah okay all right let's let's go into the relevant parts so so this is dagny is questioning her and then she says my father was an evil man who cared for nothing but business. He had no time for love, only for money. And then her brothers and her lived on a different plane. Our aim was not to produce gadgets, but do good. We brought a great new plan to the factory. We were defeated by the greed, the selfishness, and the base animal nature of men. Uh, it was the eternal conflict between spirit and matter. They would not renounce their bodies, which was all we asked them. Let's see what else is here. Okay. We put into practice that noble historical precept from each according to his ability, each according to his need. Uh, and then the rest I could probably cut out because it's not. Uh, it required men to be motivated. Not, and I'll just do this. For their brothers. Yep, yeah, and then I'll do that. We'll do the next passage as well in, in relation to this. Yeah. It has cost me my faith in human nature. Uh, in four years, a plan conceived. Oh, that's interesting. Not by the cold calculations of the mind, but by the pure love of heart yeah. was brought to an end. And then, but I've seen my error and free of it. I'm through with the world of machine manufacturers of money, the world enslaved by matter. This was this one will be an interesting to relate because she's she's almost uh, as revealed in the great from spirits of India, released from the bondage to flesh, the re victory of a physical nature, the triumph over spirit of matter. I mean, okay, so with her, this was just funny. I, that's why I put it in there. But um, I, 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 this is sort of the same idea, right? Like, not not that, but maybe like this this idea of this love some for this undefined out love that is out there of this abstraction in the power yeah. of an abstraction. Yeah. Um, what would Nietzsche say to this though, like in terms of an eternal conflict between spirit and matter and people who don't renounce their bodies? Cause it, I think he would think it's, foolish and it would not even be embracing these passions of emotion and intuition we wouldn't be embracing those things and i think he would find it as unjoyful and uncaring and empty right if you had that conflict 
if you had to renounce your body, it'd be like renouncing these passions and metaphors and these ex these aesthetic feelings you have. And do you, what about when he talks about the weaving of the webs? So to you, you do it, you do it creatively, but you weave them. So I'm trying to find that quote. You weave it over the river so that it doesn't get swept by the wind, but it does get swept by the wave. So if you're so off course that everything fails and you're stuck in a little bungalow, maybe your yeah. the concepts you've weaved are, are yeah. no good. Yeah, I um, mean, not only is she not living by these metaphors, but she's not even trying to find um, some relationship with herself. Like it's, she's even removing herself from the equation. So we're not even like the person who deceives themselves. Like she's even beyond that almost. Like she's not only removing her self at her life, but she's also removing her own mind from the equation. That's what it would seem like. What would you mean by that? Like not only is she saying, oh, we should be seeking the truth Actually, it might be actually be the same thing. The only difference is she's less about the concepts and more just the emotions. Mm. She's still embracing emotion in a way. She thinks emotion can bring you to the truth. Yeah, she doesn't actually speak about herself. She speaks about yeah. other people. That's interesting. But yeah. So this she put she doesn't say why she got to this point about no. love for the brother love for brothers and this this priest historical precept that she wants to oh well, i guess this thing she wanted to do good right she was on a different plane yeah a different a different level in the columbrium um yeah and then she she decides that it cost her the faith, the project cost her the faith in human nature. So yeah, you're saying here, she's living by it. it's the pure love of heart. Like it wasn't the cold calculations of the mind, but by the pure love of the heart. So using the same approach as Nietzsche, she comes to be in the power of abstractions anyway. Um, that is interesting to note. I was like, how could she end up there if she is going through these emotions? We could say that she still thinks the thing in itself is real and exists. She just thinks, oh, emotion can bring me there. And each one encourage you to say, well, well, no, you're still deceiving yourself. You're still lying to yourself that there's this concept you created. You've tricked yourself to thinking just because it's been around a long time that it's therefore exists out there in the world separate from you. And each would say that's a concept, well, it's a metaphor like everything else. You've only been tricked that it's been, that it's pure just because it's been around for so long. And he would just tell you to not aim for consistency anyway. So just because it works today doesn't, is that, but that yeah. seems like pragmatism. It might work today, bit. might not work today. A little mm. bit. It's more skepticism, I would say. Yeah. Rather than strictly pragmatism. I mean, a pragmatist would say that, but I think it's more broad than that here. It's like just skepticism. You need to say, well, throughout that idea of this pure love or pure truth or pure whatever, just throw it out. And um, with this, so one, one thing I want to think about more because it relates to what she's saying here is that if you do put yourself in the power of the emotions and intuitions, aren't you still you're still essentially putting yourself in the power of other people's abstractions, right? Not, not your own, like her, she wants to do the good and yeah. to her, the good is the noble and his historical precept. Yeah. It's so, so how would Nietzsche avoid if he's saying create your own perceptual metaphors from intuitions, how would he avoid getting trapped if he's not thinking about them using the intellect, how would he avoid getting trapped in just other people's precepts? Could he? I don't know if he could have such a story. You know, he's, he's talking about building a little hut using yeah. using his creative imagination. Like, uh, yeah, how would he not end up 
like this or, or what adopting whatever? How did he end up rejecting everything if he's using all these intuitions? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say the answer has to be reason. That's the yeah. only way you could do such a thing. Right. So I don't know how Nietzsche would answer that. At least not from the perspective of this time he wrote this. I could answer it from like the perspective of the last few things he wrote, but I don't think from this point in his right. thinking you could answer it. I, I guess it also depends on his conception of reason and intuition, because there could be a yeah. lot of overlap between both when yes. the way he's thinking about it, which I, I don't know enough to, right. to comment on. So yeah. Okay. Uh, and then out of curiosity, so this is with this approach of, you have an idea and it doesn't work and then you just damn human nature. Yeah. And then, and then you end up, if you have any thoughts on, so you end up damning human nature and then you end up rejecting matter. Like you're like, I'm yeah. trying to emancipate the spirit. And I, I, it, this is not a, you know, it's funny, like we're laughing at this, but this is not a, um, like this stereotype is a thing. I have you, there's a book called, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Eat, Pray, Love. Yes, I know it. And, oh, uh, you know, it. yeah. And she like, she runs off to, you know, she does all these little retreats in India yeah. and you, you see these, uh, you see these characterizations pop up quite a bit where someone has, yeah. they're like trying to, emancipate themselves yeah it's not, yeah I, in a way it's like if we want to use Nietzsche as the example here like this person is it kind of realize well yeah I was lying to myself the whole time there's this web of deception and lies and now I accept the truth and they're all metaphors so instead of just accepting that she just goes says oh the problem isn't my thoughts the problem is the body so now i just need to reject my body and everything will be okay like she's still attached to this pureness instead of saying it was a oh was so she all she's right down. okay she's doubling down so because you're this intrinsicist <laughs> you just go even more extreme right so you start out with yeah. an idea it doesn't work so you damn all of human nature and then once you've damned all of human nature you damn your body <laughs> and yeah. and so you just until you're nothing is that is that the, yes <laughs> is I that the logical so. progression okay that's i think really so interesting. that's yeah. the logical end of it that you are not <laughs> and you don't even need to exist that would be the ultimate end of this the uh, logical conclusion hmm interesting all right <laughs> 